Welcome. I expected and see that this is a highly attended and sought after event. We all would like to know what the secrets are in investing in the markets. I promise you, you will get it uh, from these four individuals. Careful, careful. When, when I, I didn't say anything untoward. I'm just talking about wisdom. When uh, I think about reunion and how to set up reunion every year for the business school, I look to one of my icons for advice, and that's Richard Rogers, of Rogers and Hammerstein fame. <laughs> Richard Rogers said it was very uh, easy to have a successful musical. You had to have a tune they could hum. And it was always a particular spot in a Rogers and Hammerstein hit. You are sitting in the tune you can hum. This is the one you will remember uh, at the close of reunion. Investing has obviously been a key part of Columbia Business School's DNA as it is for the economy in the centennial of the school. And something must have been in the water in 1967, uh, or the period from 1965 to 1967 to be specific, that led to a set of rock star investors, four of whom we have on the panel today, Spanning the whole spectrum of investing, I know that right now in the investment world, passive investing and ETFs are the moniker. We have four individuals who have distinguished themselves by their own individual analytical activity, not as passive investors. I'm going to turn the program over to my colleague and friend, Tano Santos, who is the David and Elsie Dodd Professor of Finance and Economics, co-director of our Graham and Dodd Center, who has the difficult task of moderating these four stars uh, for the next hour. I would have taken the task myself, except I have to moderate Bruce Greenwald and Joe Stiglitz this afternoon, and that was already exhausting, and I couldn't manage both in one day. So I'm turning it now over to Tano. Welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Glenn. I will sit uh, in a moment, but, uh, you know, as Glenn said, I'm the David and Elsie Dodd Professor of Finance. I co-direct the Helbron Center for Graham and Dodd Investing with, uh, with uh, Bruce Greenwald, and it's my honor to run the panel this morning uh, with these giants of the U.S. financial service industry, a class of 67, as Glenn said. So let me introduce first uh, Lee Cooperman, of course, at Goldman Sachs uh, for 25 years where he was uh, the top portfolio strategy analyst in the, in the country, according to institutional investors, for uh, nine, eight, nine years, no, 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 no. nine years. Uh, now at Omega Advisors, uh, uh, Mr. Russ Carson, uh, next uh, a pioneer in venture capital and private investment. I believe you were in Citicorp Venture Capital after you left uh, the business school, went on to found WCAS, where he has deployed on the north of $20 billion over the last 37 years very successfully. Mario uh, Gabelli, of course, the CEO and chairman of uh, GAMCO. Mario, a legend in the value investing community, of course. He comes every year to uh, the value investing with legends class, where he's, of course, the highlight of the uh, uh, year for the students. I believe we're sitting again in another panel in a couple of weeks in Omaha, right, Mario? So yes. we see exactly. So uh, we see each other quite often. I'm lucky enough. <laughs> Uh, on that score, and of course, Mr. R. Samba, perhaps of all the members in the panel, the one who has the broadest experience across many markets and different strategies at Peacock Capital Management, now Hawks, a partner at Carrier Woods. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being here. Let me just, before we start, say something as someone who's been at Columbia Business School since 2003, a foreigner in this country, living here for the last 23, uh, 25 years now, oh my God. And, uh, you know, as a foreigner, as a European, I'm always in awe of the generosity of the American wealthy when it comes to public institutions, whether it be hospitals, charities, uh, the top educational institutions of this country, and so on and so forth. I've served in many different capacities, thanks to Glenn, in the school. There's no, you know, whenever you, there's a new initiative in the school, whether it be the Helbron Center, the Sandberg Center, which is absolutely crucial in the life of the business school, their name always shows up. Uh, they've given up more than $200 million uh, over the course of the last uh, you know, 20 years. There have been more members uh, in the school. And Glenn told me cheerfully this morning that they're not done yet. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> never in doubt. Give him down. So, thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for that as well. Vote on that? <laughs> so, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to.
By the way, the last time I ran a panel with you guys, I was only able to get one question That's in. That's the way we want. <laughs> so I'm going to be tough with you guys. No, you're not. Uh, and <laughs> try me, Mario. And um, so let me start with something that I think is in everybody's mind. Uh, Glenn has brought some of these issues, but let me start with one thing. Whenever we teach the class, Bruce and I, the value investing class, the students, whenever we give talks to a You may want to use that. Yeah. Whenever we give, you guys, can you guys hear me all the way? No. I figured you got to. You're now wired. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope this works, yeah. So anyway, whenever the students, not yet, not yet. I'll stand up. Hey. It's got to be a. It's got to be something. Uh, you know what it is? There, he wasn't, he wasn't there it is. There it is. There it is. Hello. Hello. Okay. Use, use the mic. I'll stand up. So as I was saying, whenever the students uh, want us to know a little bit about uh, markets, they start with the current state of the market, okay? And if you look at uh, yields across many different markets, if you look at the P ratios, for instance, of U.S. markets, you will have to go back to the tech bubble or to the 1920s to find valuations like the ones we're seeing today. So my first question for you guys, and I hope it's not the last one, is... Uh, <laughs> Why do you guys think this valuation is where it is, whether you know, something about the world is much less risky on account of that, the risk appetite has increased and that's why the valuations are so high, whether it's something about future earnings growth uh, of the U.S. economy, say, whether there's perhaps some behavioral bias, there's some, something about the psychology market. And the second question, if you want to answer it in parts, so yes, to get it in, you know, where are you guys finding value these days, given these valuations? Are you concerned about the uh, yields being so compressed across different markets? And don't be shy about giving us the specific ideas. We would be most thankful for them. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lee, why don't you, why don't you take it? Uh, why don't you start? And, uh, you know, feel free to react to each other. I know you will. I'm done. <laughs> is this mic on? I don't think it is. No, no, get closer. Yeah, Just, there's a little switch. I have to swallow it. You know, you, you, you guys, it's called technology, Lee. You push it through. Yeah, Lee, Lee, you want this one? Yeah, this one's not I, I, I'm not going to say anything. Okay. <laughs> uh, the answer to your question is very simple. This morning I printed out off of Bloomberg 10-year uh, yields across the world. So the United States is a high-yield country at 2.2% for the 10-year. Canada won four. Uh, Germany 24 basis points for 10 years. In other words, if you lend money to, the, to Germany, for, if you lend money to Germany for 10 years, you get 24 basis points. If you lend money to the Japanese government for 10 years, you get zero. If you lend money to uh, Switzerland for 10 years, you pay them 25 right. basis points to hold your money. <laughs> so, you know, the answer to your question is, you know, the market is not expensive if interest rates stay where they are. Um, and and I, my own view is we're, we're in the process of normalizing. And, you know, the world for the last eight or nine years has been totally turned upside down. I'm giving you a long-winded answer, but it's comprehensive. You know, four years ago during the election between, you know, uh, when uh, Obama successfully defined Romney's wealth as a liability and beat him. And during this last election cycle, we got some guy who stands up there and says, I'm richer than you think, and the public loves it. The odds are he's not richer than you think, but the public loves it. So, you know, in the last eight or nine years, we've been in an environment uh, of, um, you know, zero interest rates, and I think we're returning to normal. So the question you have to ask is, what is normal? I may be wrong. We have a bunch of economists, including my past professor in economics 50 years ago, Reynolds Sachs in the audience, but to me, normal roughly would be a half of 1% growth in the labor force, one and a half percent trend productivity growth. So real labor force growth and productivity growth would define real growth. So that's 2% put another 2% for inflation, so nominal GDP growing about 4%. In a 4% nominal growth world, I think the Fed funds rate belongs at 2%, not 65 basis points, wherever it is now, and the 10-year belongs at 4%. Um, in that world, I think the multiple in the market could be justified around 17 times. Okay. Okay, and the big issue now is does Trump get his tax package to or not? Because, you know, a trillion dollar repatriation of earnings and lowering the corporate tax rate to near 20% will add $10 to S&P earnings. So on an optimistic side, S&P earnings next year could be uh, 142. If I take 17 times 142, that's 24.15. 
The market is 2350, whatever it is, 2360. It's fully valued, but not overvalued. And then one of our distinguished alumnus who was very cagey on TV, Warren Buffett, a couple of weeks ago, he said if interest rates stay here, the stock market isn't expensive. But interest rates aren't going to stay here unless we kind of continue to have confiscation of Sabre's capital. So Lee, let me, I, yeah, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me let me then. So you, you really think that what is driving these valuations is basically policy decisions. There's nothing fundamental that has changed about... Yeah, uh, well, again, I, I, I make myself a statistician. For the last 50 years, the S&P multiple averaged 15. It's now 17 times uh, an optimistic estimate. When the market multiple was 15 for the last 50 years, the 10-year government averaged 667. It's currently 235. And Treasury bills average close to 5%, currently now less than 1%. So uh, relative to interest rates, the market is not expensive at all. Okay. Not expensive at all. But yeah. you know, no, nobody in this room, myself included, believes interest rates are going to stay here for the long term. Very good. Russ, why don't you take it a little bit? Uh, you, know, you have a lot of experience, of course, in private markets. And uh, you know, I've always been curious about this, you know, how these kind of... It's much more difficult as an academic to get data on private markets and what are the things trading for in private markets essentially and what is the rate at which you can invest yeah, there. So it, 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 it's very true in the private markets. Uh, today in the private equity business, people are routinely paying 10 to 12 times uh, EBITDA, which is the measure that we use as sort of a rough measure of cash flow of a business. Uh, if you went back uh, 20 years, it used to be we bought things at six to seven times EBITDA, so the prices have gone up. Uh, but you can rationalize the increase in price by the fact that you can borrow more money at lower interest rates uh, th than you could in the past. So it enables you to pay a higher price. You know, I think the thing none of us know is exactly where all this is going. That, uh, it, particularly in the private equity business, a lot of our debt is, is bank debt, which is floating rate. Inevitably, uh, interest rates are going to rise. Bank, bank interest rates will rise, and that debt will become more expensive. Uh, I think a lot of people in my industry are looking at uh, you try and repay as much of the debt as you can as quickly as you can before the rates rise and, and, and create a problem for you. Uh, the one other thing I'd add to what Lee said is uh, I, I can't give you a good number. He probably could, but the dividend yield on the S&P 500, probably 2%, uh, and, and the dividends grow over time. Uh, I, I think there are a lot of people, and, and I'm one of them with my personal investments, uh, find it very attractive to invest in the public market where you can get a a premier company that has some growth attached to it uh, where you can get a 2 or 3% yield, uh, or you can buy another area I've been investing in has been uh, master limited partnerships in the oil and gas industry. You can get a 7 or 8% yield on a current basis with the possibility of uh, uh, rising dividends over time. So there are, lots of, there are lots of interesting opportunities in the market around right now. This environment won't last forever, but it's, uh, it's a unique one and one where you can really take advantage of it if, if you can think through where we're headed. But the, can, can I say, so just to, so, but you're focusing on income. I mean, you like, you know, this, uh, you're focusing on a lot of your, of your valuations on this dividend yield component of your, of your returns these days. Is that? Uh, uh, it, in terms of, uh, no, in terms of what we do professionally, it's all capital gain. Okay. We're, That's what I think. Basically, exactly. our companies are always leveraged. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Oh. So, very good. Mario, uh, you know, uh, Tom, are you worried you. about these valuations? Are you still finding great opportunities uh, out there for your clients and yourself? I don't want to talk about any stocks, but Madison Square Garden, which is located here, <laughs> <laughs> and the Rangers, which are playing tonight. I, have, I was wondering why everyone is here. I have tickets because I'm going to the dinner. So if anybody wants the Rangers tickets. But, uh, <laughs> look, this classroom brings a lot to me because this is where I, knowing I wanted to be in the equity market, was a student at Roger Murray. Okay, it was only 600 months ago in which I, I, learned, <laughs> I learned about, uh, you know, the moon, the sun, and the stars of value investing. The second thing I want to comment on is that looking to my right, your left, is Arthur Sandberg. Looking to my left, your right, is Russ Carson and then Lee Koopman. Now I know, Thanos, how it feels to be a poor billionaire. <laughs> We will, we all feel very bad for you, Mario. Yeah, I, we, uh, I, I know Glenn organized the benefit, not for Columbia, but for me. Uh, the, um, <laughs> look, uh, what we do is bottoms-up research. We have a, a circle of competency, which we uh, have compounded and accumulated knowledge on industries. So let's say a simple business, like if whatever you watch anywhere in the world on content or connectivity, we look at it, and there's always some opportunity. And, you know, the markets will go up, the markets will go down, but we, 
we, we basically pick stocks, and that's what we do, and there are a lot of bargains out there. So uh, the markets will come down sharply. The markets may stay unchanged, uh, and uh, that's what we do every day. Arthur? <laughs> you guys take it. So I was in the same uh, class with Mary, with Roger Murray, and, and, and our project at the end of it was something that none of you have probably ever heard of. It was called Harvey Aluminum. And, you know, I did this brilliant, I'm very analytic, or at least I used to be, um, and I do this analysis, and I get a good grade, and there's only one person who got a better grade than I did, and that was Mario. And why did Mario get the better grade? Because he got, he got the answer to the riddle. What happens with old man Harvey dies? I don't think about dying as an investment concept. I've, I've always thought about creating as an investment concept. So I, I don't do what these guys do. I, I try and find the next big thing and try and find ways to play it. And it sort of doesn't matter if the trailing, you know, normalized P on the market is 10% above average or it just, it, 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 it doesn't matter that much. So in this sort of new creative space, all of you have read about unicorns um, and how they were under, overvalued and how, you know, some of the mutual funds got in and they had to mark them down by 25, 30, 40, 50 percent. What is not mentioned in those articles is that you, you went into that environment with 142 unicorns and you went out of it with 158. The creative part of this economy is still very robust and there's all kinds of stuff happening. It's not for everybody. There's a lot of volatility. But I'm having a ball. I, I don't worry about anything that's going to be talked about on this panel. So these very peculiar. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys, I mean, so let me let me understand this. I mean, the market has been, the market has been, uh, you know, rather peculiar. Let's say over the last, uh, not only just few years, but only the few, the last few months, the run-up since the election has been uh, quite a striking, uh, quite a striking as well. But if I understand you guys correctly, you haven't changed anything of what you guys have been doing. Uh, over the last few years on account of these uh, kind of rich valuations that we've seen uh, in the market. The method is staged, value investing principles still apply, no changes whatsoever. Is that correct? Russ, you... That, it doesn't work your... Let's see if this works. Yeah. This is not a Lend-Lease program here. Does this work? Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, uh, what, what we're doing in private equity in my firm and, and most of the other private equity firms, we, we, we've been in a heavy period of liquidation for the last three years. Uh, our business is very different. Uh, I, I was going to differentiate myself as part of this panel. These three guys buy stocks. I buy companies. Uh, very, very different discipline uh, but with a lot, a lot of overlap in, uh, in that at the end of the day, public market valuations do affect what price we buy at and what price we sell at. In this environment, we've probably liquidated more, more than half of our portfolio uh, by selling or taking public and distributing uh, the companies that we've been involved in. Our, our distributions to our limited partners have probably been three times uh, what our new investments have been over the last uh, three years. So uh, this is a period where I think you need to be wary. I'm in a long-term investment business. Our partnerships are 12-year partnerships. Our average hold period is uh, six to eight years. Uh, but when you see a period like this, it's a good idea to take money off the table in a serious way, and, and that's what we've been doing, and everybody else in the private, industry, uh, private equity industry has been doing the same. Mm -hmm. Lee? Uh, I would this, uh, answer your observation a little differently. I mean, I would be, I'd be reducing exposure, um, that the market is uh, less attractively priced, but uh, my point is I don't think the market's like overvalued. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fully valued right. uh, and vulnerable to any negative surprise. But in the history of market cycles, if you step back and look, there generally there are four causes of a bear market, taken one at a time. First reason you have a bear market is the stock market's leading indicator smells a coming recession and declines in anticipation of recession. Uh, the economic data does not support any forecast of recession at the present time. Uh, in fact, as you could argue, the economy is getting a little bit stronger. But I, I say it's growing 2 percent, but right. not recessionary. Right. The second um, uh, cause of a bear market is we become extremely overvalued, euphoric in pricing, vulnerable to any surprise. I often quote Sir John Templeton, which was a great comment, the, an observation he made. I only wish I coined it, I didn't, but he said, bull markets are born in pessimism, they grow in skepticism, they mature in optimism, and they die in euphoria. Uh, <laughs> pessimism ended in 2010, we're clearly in optimism, but I see very few signs of euphoria in the market. 
the individual is not participating aggressively, they're still buying bond funds. If there's a bubble anywhere, the bubble's in fixed income, not in equities. Third cause of bear markets, the hostile Fed. And we have a Fed that, frankly, my opinion, is two years behind the curve. They're very reluctant to raise rates, and clearly interest rates are totally uncompetitive with returns to stocks. You know, Russ mentioned he can buy a bunch of high-quality companies yielding 2%, which is in line with a 10-year government, and the only way the government's going to address, address, you know, adjust to higher inflation is to decline in price to keep the coupon current, whereas companies could raise prices to, which lay, raises the nominal level of revenues and earnings, and so over time they'll benefit from inflation. And the fourth reason you have a bear market is some kind of unforecastable geopolitical event, which is significant, catches the market by surprise. And let's face it, there's a lot to worry about. We've got a head case in the White House at the present time, and, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, in 62 you had the Cuban Missile Crisis, and you had the uh, President Kennedy con uh, you know, confidence crisis with the steel industry. A lot to worry about, whether it's Russia, Ukraine, uh, North Korea, et cetera, et cetera. But these are non-forecastable events which you can't really invest for. But I would say if I look at the things that cause a bear market, the market's richly appraised. You've got to be careful in what you're doing, but uh, I don't think the market is, you know, overvalued. Okay. And I think uh, Art could be cavalier in his comment. If the stock market and the economy craps out, his crap is going to go down. Uh, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> He 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 he. Well, that took long. He 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 needs an extra strategy. Wait a minute, wait a minute. He needs an extra strategy to the. Wait 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 wait. He's got. I gotta listen to the rebuttal here. No no. Number one, you invest in crap. I invest in growth. I'm invest. I'm an investor in a few of your companies. Number two, I, I, I will admit I'm at a disadvantage because in, in the last tech bubble, I had a hedge fund, and that hedge fund made money in the two years after it imploded because you could short. Nobody can short any longer because the, the, the system is stacked against you. So do I worry that some of these marvelous, earth-changing companies will be revalued? Yeah, I do. So what do I do? I do what... I do what Russ does. I'm trying to sell the mature ones yeah. um, and not reinvest it back in the new ones. Um, so, yeah, I, of course I'll be hit. Yeah. So can I, <laughs> can I build on something that I just said, uh, you know, which is, so we've done with this kind of general view on the valuations of the markets, but markets have changed as well dramatically over the last few years. I think Glenn mentioned this growth and in passive investing. Uh, our students ask us all the time about this, what is the future of value investing in a world where 95% of the trade or the volume is done by, by machines. And I wanted to have your take on this. What do you guys think overall? Uh, you know, I have several questions about the institutional construct of the market, but I want to, uh, you know, I want to get your views on this. Lee, you seem hey, to be already well, taking I, the mic. I, I'll, I'll, so, uh, I'll address it from the hedge fund side, but look, everything is cyclical. Uh, including uh, this? Including yes, this? Uh, this? Absolutely. Let me tell you, uh, one of the most distinguished writers at Fortune magazine is Carol Loomis. She has co-authored Warren Buffett's annual report for 50 years. She's a smart lady. She wrote an article, the headline on the article was, Hard Times Come to Hedge Funds. If you look at the article, it was January of 1970. Go do a little data research. In 1970, January, the largest hedge fund was Steinhardt, Fine, and Berkowitz at $49 million. The second largest hedge fund was A.W. Jones at $35 million. The entire industry was under a billion dollars. The industry today is close to $3 trillion. So obviously a very bad call. Now, the golden period for hedge funds, and I'm going to get to the answer your question. My view, I, I could be dead wrong. No. The golden period for hedge funds was 2000 to 2007. They were outperforming the S&P. They were outperforming conventional long-only managers, and money was coming in over the transom. And they became cocktail party talk. I'm with uh, Omega. I'm with Glenview. I'm with Pershing Square. I'm with Third Point. Who are you with? Hedge funds performed their role in 2008. The average hedge fund was down 16%. The S&P was down 34%. But people said, what the hell is this? I didn't realize you could lose money. I thought it was a question of how much money I'm going to make. I want out. And so it was enormous redemptions due to fear of what was going on in the economy and the performance of hedge funds, even though they lived up to their role. And the hedge funds, in my opinion, hurt themselves because many of them either gated capital or closed up and didn't honor a high water mark. And a high water mark is an asset to the investor. It's one thing if the investor wants their money back, then you give it to them. It's another thing to involuntarily give an investor money back when you're down because you are supposed to work yeah. for nothing until you get back to where you were your previous high point. 
Then we get into the period 2009 to 2017, you, where you've been in a trended bull market. Now, an investor is elected to be in a hedge fund. He expects to be hedged. He expects to have some shorts on. He doesn't think he's fully invested. He's an absolute return investor. Okay? Anyone who's had a hedge on the last seven to eight years since 2009 can't keep up with a trended bull market. And so all this is going to change when the next bear market arrives and people differentiate themselves. And just like in 2008 when the public woke up and said, gee, I didn't know I can lose money in the hedge fund. Give me my money back. All this money flowing into the index is going to basically be very disappointed when the index goes down. But it may take a couple of years. Yeah. But uh, that's ultimately what's going to happen. Right. Indexation is looking at the future through a rearview mirror. You know, uh, these guys, who I love, didn't get to where they got. Warren Buffett didn't get to where he got by buying an index. Right. So everything is seasonal. Everything is cyclical. Uh, this too shall pass. Portfolio insurance was 87. Now it's uh, artificial intelligence. It's very significant. I went to a seminar about... So, so passive ago. investment is not... The no, new no, normal. It, it plays a role in a lot, you know, it depends. We're not right. running a trillion dollars. I wish right. I was. Right now I'm trying to hold on to what I got because the SEC has screwed up my business. But basically, <laughs> you know, um, you know un unjustifably, I might add, but that's a different, that's a, that's a, that's a seminar. Operating as a businessman today in this world we live in is a, se is a separate seminar that's worth discussing. Okay, but um, uh, I went to a seminar about a year or so ago. It had nothing to do with investing. The title of the seminar was Closing the Gap. It was focused on income disparity. It is a signer of the Buffett Pledge. Basically, I'm very interested in income disparity and how you, uh, you help cure it. And there was a futurist who gave a presentation. And uh, I always, before I tell you what he said, I always like to quote Buffett. He says, forecasts of the future tell you more about the forecast than they tell you about the future. But what this futurist said, which I think is becoming commonly accepted, is the biggest problem facing the economy is in the next decade, 45% of all jobs will be replaced by automation. And there's no alternative employment for these displaced workers. Right. As I thought about it, and I went home that night, I said, gee, uh, uh, automation, uh, passive management, is the same thing for automation for the investment management business. So at the end of the day, the proposition you have to accept, you cannot justify a premium fee unless you deliver premium performance. Right. Okay? So, and so if we have uh, passive turnover is 3% a year. Active turnover is 30% a year. If more money goes passive, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, that whole group is going to have less revenues to deal with. So they've got to resize their research effort. Right, and the money manager, basically, is going to see less turnover, less liquidity in the market, more difficult to get your things done. And then on the uh, money manager side, uh, obviously, if you're going to manage money for five basis points in a passive index, uh, you're going to have a huge shrinkage of revenue. Yeah. So I, I think but it's a sickle phenomena. For the large money, a certain amount of indexation is relevant, but I would not in any way give up an active man. Absolutely not. I mean, I, you know, in a way, the way I see it, and uh, you know, I want to have Ross Art and uh, Mario comment on this, is in a way, someone needs to actually do the tough job of collecting this information, analyzing these companies, assessing the profitability of these particular risks, and so on and so forth. So in a way, your role is going to become even more important, given how much capital is in the hands of people who are actually doing nothing of this job of actually allocating capital across uh, investment alternatives. Is that how you guys see it as well? Or what? <laughs> Importance and remunerative, something that's remunerative can be very different. Right. Um, and I don't see that changing for a long time. Um, the, you know, everything, I agree with everything Lee said, but if you look, there are people who are still making money. And they're the algorithmic traders. It's the three sigmas, it's the uh, renaissances, it's absolutely. those people. Yeah. And that trend is... Well, there are many ways of making money, you know, of they're course. They're making yeah. good money. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and some so of it is a giant case of front-running the public. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. There's a lot of front-running going on. But some it, of it. Let's leave that aside. Yeah, sure. And there are people who would say what you did was front-running the public, too. And me, because I'm out of business. So, uh, you know, uh, no doubt that that's always a part of, of markets, which is way overemphasized by, by those who don't understand markets. Um, but I, I, I think this is a tidal wave that's going to continue for quite some time. Right, And right. just like Lee said in the beginning, the thing that's going to change it is a change in one of these exogenous factors. It's not going to change until that happens. Right. So it's all wrapped up in the same thing. Mario? Yeah, there's not much I can add, but uh, from my point of view, uh, there's also, it's not a question of ETFs. It's a question, obviously, of the fees, and the fees are driven by lawyers, and the lawyers are basically looking to create uh, economic gain for their uh, particular point of emphasis. Our role is simple. What we want to do, and what we want to do, and we do every day, every minute, is look, and our turnover, by the way, is 5%. So it means we uh, hold them longer than you with us, and uh, 
So we buy businesses that we think are going to work for the next 10 or 20 years. And there's so many great opportunities out there. And what you try to do is to buy them at the right price. And so patience is required. And the, the, uh, an, in a world of instant performance and where consultants ask you what you did yesterday, that is a challenge. So we look out over the next five or ten years and say, what's going to happen? Natural, organic, antibiotic. Think about things like uh, live entertainment in a world where everything is uh, uh, going in on uh, uh, a certain way of watching things. And uh, so what's going to change? And we need to continue to do what we're doing. And, uh, you know, for the next 30 or 40 years, we'll figure it out. Russ, uh, you know, yeah, but, you're, you're but a little bit more... Uh, let me just gonna change, out. Arthur, except these little blips. Yeah. But I, I want you to comment on one more thing, Russ, which is you're a little bit more shelter of these developments, given that you act on the private sphere, which lends itself less to this kind of competition with passive investors, essentially. So, but, but please take it. Yeah, I, I spent very little time worrying about exactly. that. Exactly. I, I wanted to put some of this in historical context. Uh, I, I remember early in my career, and I think it was 1974, the New York Stock Exchange had a day where it traded 10 million shares, and it literally almost broke the street. The, the back office and the street couldn't keep up with it. Uh, a couple of major brokerage houses failed when that happened. Mm -hmm. Now compare that with today, where you have hundreds of millions of shares traded every day, all because of technology and electronics. And I'd, I'd argue that you can argue a lot of this uh, machine trading uh, several different ways, but one thing that it's done is it's brought tremendous liquidity to markets. And for somebody like us that owns companies, we own large percentages of the companies that we invest in. When we want to get out, if we want to get out through the public market, we now have a market that can absorb large trading volumes, large numbers of shares uh, of stock. So I, I think net-net, uh, the, the technology here has been very positive as right. opposed to negative. Right. I think it's interesting liquidity has been aided. Uh, By this, not, yeah. Not, not uh, day to day liquidity. These guys go home flat. They don't want to carry any inventory. There is, I would take a very different view. The liquidity in the market stinks. The liquidity in the market stinks, basically. The special system is not functioning. The brokers, can, because of Dodd-Frank, cannot really take risk. The commission structure does not reward them for taking risk. It is very difficult to get things done. So can I, so I, want, I, want, I wanted to talk about this a little bit, about Dodd-Frank. And, uh, you know, it's very frequent to go, to go out at night in New York and talk with some people in the banking industry and how much the regulatory oversight has impaired the functioning of financial markets. Do you guys, do you guys yeah, feel it? Let me give you a little uh, an, an, an story. Uh, I graduated from yeah, Columbia yeah. January. Mike, 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 they can't Mike. hear you. Oh, they can't hear you, sir. Yeah. You would think we can put a man in the moon, we can have more than one functioning mic. Anyway, uh, <laughs> to give you my, my story, uh, and it's the same story as everybody else in this panel. I got my degree from Columbia January 31st, 1967. At a six-month-old child at a time, no money in the bank, National Defense Education Act student loan, couldn't take a vacation, went to Goldman Sachs the next day, February 1, 67. I was very fortunate. All right, all right. How much did you start with? I said with? like everybody else in the, the panel. $10,000 salary? No, nothing. No, 13000 total. What about uh -huh. it? <laughs> anyway, um, I was very fortunate to get into a session uh, with the legendary Sidney Weinberg Sr., John Weinberg's father, who was Mr. Wall Street, uh, was the head of the War Production Board on the Roosevelt. You can't believe it. I remember Conceptual Foundation of Business with uh, Professor Eels, uh, uh, talking about the role of corporate boards of directors. Mr. Weinberg at one time was in 35 boards, General Electric, Ford Motor, General Cigar, you name it, okay? It's unheard of today, given what governance is all about. But Mr. Weinberg made an interesting comment that stuck with me. For why it stuck with me, I don't know. He said, Goldman Sachs would never have as a partner an attorney that practice as an attorney. We can get the best legal advice the firm needs on the outside that happened to use Sullivan Cromwell. We don't need a practicing attorney. Now, if he was an attorney that became an investment banker, that's fine. Well, today, Goldman Sachs has five partners that are full-time attorneys and a legal compliance function of over 1,000 people. So, Dodd, Frank, quote what you want. They don't take a dump without talking to their lawyers. <laughs> This is the regulation, this is the regulation, and this is a problem in business. I have two full-time SEC compliant attorneys on my payroll. Right. Okay. So a wonderful image to have in one set for 1125. You know. uh, but, ha, but has that impaired a little bit the leverage that people can take in the market, and as a result, has that had an effect on prices, do you guys think? And what do you guys think? Are we going to do away with this? Are we going to do away with all this regulatory oversight, and that's going to improve? Uh, 
liquidity market? Let, let me do it a totally different way. I go to a meeting for Schlumberger. There's 400 analysts in the meeting. I go to see a company called XYZ. There are four. This, the good news is there's nobody doing research on small and mid-cap yeah. companies, and how are we going to create the exactly. next giants of industry if we can't have uh, individuals following those kind of companies and if they're all computer? The good news about artificial intelligence, and most of us have native intelligence, the women have clearly beat that with uh, their own intelligence. But the point is that uh, I like that kind of competition. I like the fact that everyone is going here and looking for ETFs. Uh -huh. Because there's an inherent advantage because I'm trying to buy a business before I sell it to Russ. And I'm trying to get, I'm try, I'm trying to get that company which the PE guy wants to buy. You try to figure out what their exit strategy is five, year, five years from now and, how, and, what the, and the financing parfait today. And uh, that's what we do when we look at all these companies and say, okay, don't look at where the hockey puck is today, uh, where the puck is today, but where it's going to be. How do we make money five years from now? How do we generate that kind of returns? If the index on ETF over the next 10 years is going to grow 7 8% because inflation is picking up, and somebody can d give you these numbers, I'm sure they will. Uh, basically, uh, what we try to do is add 500 basis points to that. And uh, if we can't do that, we shouldn't be in business. And we have done that for 40 years without leverage, and we're going to continue to do it for the next 40 years. Across all these follow... changes and across all these cycles. Yeah, well, we've had five down yeah. periods. I think the practical thing, that the industry is breaking down to two categories of investors. They have the passive indexation algorithmic traders, and then you have what Mario and I do for Absolutely. a living, what Art used to do for a living. He's in a better game now. Yeah. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't market the market. I can tell you what I do for a living. He's making more money time. now. Yeah. No, no, seriously. So you got the one part of the industry are the algorithmic high-frequency trading types, and they're doing very well, right. and they're really in the driver's seat now. And the other side of the industry is what Mario and I do for a living. The trouble with it is that the investors develop a very short-sightedness and demand performance relative to the index is very hard to be a long-term investor. I agree with Mario. I, I made my fortune, you know, betting. I had a, a, a holding period in Teldyne for 25 years, okay? And so I'm willing to be an investor if I have the right horse. The trouble with being an investor today is if your investors don't have the same horizon and you're faced, in my case, quarterly liquidity demands, annual liquidity demands, it's very hard to make a five-year investment. Now, the good thing for me is, you know, half the money we're managing now is our own capital. So I look at my business as a family yeah, you office. Can afford the, right, so yeah. I can afford to take the long term Absolutely. and, you know, if I screw up, I'm screwing up myself. <laughs> so they, they're, they're giving great um, pitches for their business. But they're not answering your question. Yeah, no, of course. I've noticed this, but I, there's so much I can do. But I, I'm, used, I'm, I'm used to these guys. I can do it, you can't. Um, so the, the, the facts are, the facts are that, that 15, 20 years ago, there were 6,800 publicly traded companies. There are now 3,400. A lot of that is because of Dodd-Frank. A lot of that also, though, is because the, the, the American industrial system is changing. Um, I, 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 I was an engineer early in life, and, and, and so I've had this interest in this stuff. And, 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 and really, the way businesses were before, when you had Bell Labs or whoever it was, research was done in-house, products were developed in-house, and they were introduced to the market. Now that you've got all the sophistication in the system, companies don't want to spend on R&D. It hurts earnings, it hurts stock options, it hurts everything else. So what they do is, they wait until some young guys go out and find some product, and they wait for the pivot point when it's about to become profitable. And when it becomes profitable, they have a 1,000 salesmen, and the company has 10. Um, and they can leverage the earnings. And they can also, by the way, put it on the balance sheet. And it's a capital asset, and they don't have to write it off in earnings. So the way products are developed, the way companies are run, is completely different. And part of it is to get around all of this baloney that's been added to the system. So there is a fundamental change. And these guys are going to be able to find the remaining 3,400 companies that um, are, are, are under, or the, that portion of them that are undervalued. But in general, we're in a new world. Yeah, and I mean, this is something that we discuss quite a bit internally, that uh, there's been this drop in the number of risks that, or names that are traded in public markets. A lot of it must, go, must be going through private markets and, you know, technology, human capital in markets, the capital in private markets has increased considerably over the last few years. Uh, but it's worrisome, particularly because the public at large won't have access to those opportunities. 
public so loses out. Worried about what? What that you know, a lot of those risks lead, don't go to the public market. So the general investor cannot have a, an equity stake on that wonderful company that is going to remain private. Of stocks? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, you know, and shorter of risk. You're going to get five eighths of percent in, in, in Fed funds. You're going to get. 2.3% of government. microphone, darling. You, you, want to own, you want to own more stocks, right? You want to, we, we, if you're going to, we, we leave today, we come back for our 60th anniversary, not the 50th. Where do you want to be for the next 10 years? Do you want to be in a company that will be growing over the next decade, that pays you 2% while you wait on average? Or do you want to be in a government bond yielding 2.3% uh, when you have a government that's uh, running an enormous deficit? And just step back, you know, what Trump is advocating and I like his economic ideas, but let's step back and look at Ronald Reagan versus Donald Trump. When Ronald Reagan ran for president, he's, his platform was, I want to get the government off the backs of the people, and I'm going to do that by reducing regulation and reducing taxes. Ditto. I'm going to restore the lost prestige of the United States of America, and I'm going to do that by rebuilding defense. Ditto. He didn't say much about infrastructure. Now we've got a third infrastructure trillion dollar bill. Where do you, where do you, Reagan figured out, I can't rebuild the fence, I can't cut taxes and balance the budget, so he said, the hell with the budget, okay? Right. We, have a, we have a $20 trillion of debt, a 100 basis point increase in interest rates, and that is $200 billion, and they can't find 5 or $10 billion. So over time, inflation and interest rates are going to go up. And if they don't, everyone in this room has to get used to the fact, if you're going to make 2% in government bonds and less than 1% in cash equivalents, you don't make 15% in the stock market. You make 5 or 6% in Absolutely. the stock market. Absolutely. Russ, you want to add something to no, this? No, but let me, uh, before you do that, uh, <laughs> since, uh, since I pay bills, <clears throat> Sarbanes-Oxley's, Section 30 whatever, that's why uh, if I was running an, a venture capital company today, I would go public. What am I? Uh, first of all, 70% of our board meetings are done by checking boxes that deal with compliance. Okay, and in addition to that, only 30% we can talk to in terms of risk taking and valuation of corporate strategy. So I, when you talk about changing rules and regulations, the unintended consequences, because you know it's these two guys, Smith Hawley, put their names on a bill back in 1929, uh, and. Uh, the same thing with Section 3, uh, the uh, bills that are handicapping companies to go public. Go back to why they're not going public. What is the risk to an entrepreneur for doing it, Russ? Yeah, exactly. I wanted to get Russ in this topic. To totally yeah. agree. Uh, g going private is a very attractive option, really for two reasons. One, it gets you out of this short-term mentality in the public markets. Uh, the public markets become way too short term. My, my friends here, I, I would all say, are longer term investors, or maybe Morrow is an even longer term investor than I am. But the advantage of the private markets is you don't have the quarter to quarter pressures. You can make the right decision. The, the question we always ask ourselves with the companies we own is where are we going to be in five years? I, I, I don't give a damn where we're going to be in the next quarter. That's irrelevant. The question is, what can we do today that's going to build value in five years? So huge advantage to managements to operate in that, uh, operate in that environment. Uh, the, the other thing that's true is the, uh, the whole issue of corporate governance has gotten very complicated in this country. That we now have a whole group of activist investors who buy into companies and try and force management to do things that are in their short-term best interests. The private equity industry is totally different. We buy companies to fix them and fix them for the long term, not, not for the short term. So I, I, uh, the private market is not going away. Well, one of the things that I, I wanted to put out here again is a fact which most of you wouldn't know. When I started uh, at Citibank in 1967 in their venture capital group, which was uh, a raw startup at the time, the entire venture capital industry in the world probably had 100 players and $250 million of capital. That same industry today that's broadly called the private equity industry has somewhere between three and four trillion dollars of capital invested in it, yeah. and it has 4,000 global players. I mean, this has turned into a very major part of not just the U.S. economy, but the world economy. Right. I think most people aren't, aren't aware of where it came from, how rapidly this has happened, and, and what the implications of it are. Yeah. I, I would just I would like to make one point. A lot of this stuff in private equity has all to do with leverage. Yeah. Uh, when I, 35 years ago, when I was at Goldman Sachs, I did a study of KKR's returns versus taking, uh, taking their 2 and 20 fee structure and then looking at taking the S&P, leveraging my equity five times, which is what private equity does. They get away with it. You can't run a public company. We can't, Mario can't go out and leverage five times. If I bought the S&P 
uh, when uh, with all these private equity deals were done and rolled the S&P every quarter five times leveraged and because of a much lower fee structure, I would beat the hell out of any private equity fund. Private equity could run five times leverage. Public, com public uh, money managers can't. So a lot of the return stems from the leverage. I see. Uh, Russ, do you want to take that? I mean, no, I uh, that, 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 they pinned it. This is <laughs> like SmackDown. They both, uh, they exactly. both got SmackDown. I mean, foot fight. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, you're talking about uh, investable companies. When I started the firm in 1977 on January 1st, so 40 years for us, the total market cap, the total market cap of all equities on a global basis is $1 trillion. Today, it's 60, if you took the public company by share count, it's 70 trillion. So there's a big playing field there. And, uh, you know, I, I can find a company in Europe selling at half a book, uh, and book is cash. Yeah, that's what we can do, but you've got to look. And where are the bargains? And so the United States today is 30% of the... Because it's measured in dollars, the United States is probably 35% of the total capital markets. Yeah. So uh, where you, uh, you were only here 25 years, go yeah. back and find those businesses that you left behind when you went to the University of Chicago. Were you in Booth? Yeah, well, I was, saying, I was in Booth for uh, you know, a few years. It shows years. you that uh, Glenn and the Columbia is politically correct. They take anyone here. <laughs> I know you're an MIT guy now. So we're going to, uh, we, you know, uh, <laughs> we're going to take a couple of questions from the audience. We have a little bit of time for that. So uh, if anyone has a, uh, has a question, yell it out, we'll oh, you can yell it out, and I'll yell it back to the audience. First uh, statement, then a question. Uh, to, to the poor billionaire on the panel, <laughs> no, no offense to anyone going... No offense to anyone going to the dinner tonight, but I would gladly take your Rangers tickets. Uh, the, the question is, you mentioned carried interest. Uh, just if we can open it up sort of a bit more broadly on panel, if tax rates, for example, were cut a couple percentage points, I'd like to know how many jobs would be created by that, or if your taxes were increased by a couple percentage points, how would that limit your investment opportunities. Well, let, let's do it in a simple way since uh, you, Lee likes numbers and I uh, do as well. We as a country, we as a country spent four trillion. We take in three six. Approximately 300 billion of that is corporate taxes. You have to r rationalize the individual that's an LLC or the individual that's an S corp with a, a C corp where there's going to be a lot of changing. So from my point of view, if I'm making a hundred million dollars as a public company, and I am paying 35% tax, I keep 65 million, I pay, out 20, uh, I pay it all out as dividends, I'm paying out a 23.8% tax. And then if I, uh, so this has got to be somehow changed, because otherwise companies will locate in Dublin, they'll locate in Zug, they'll locate in Hong Kong, the tax rate in Dubai is zero. So, uh, you know, we have to figure this out to be competitive. I, I can't answer the question. We'll have Glenn back up here to talk about the job creation. And uh, you can listen to that with Stiglitz and uh, what's uh, that other guy? Uh, Greenwald. <laughs> uh, at, uh, and uh, basically this afternoon. And from my point of view, clearly uh, there is major implications for taxes in a variety of ways. And everyone on this panel should pay more. And those that are in middle America that pay uh, should pay less. Let me, uh, I like this way. First of all, you mentioned carried interest. Seven years ago on CNBC, I said there's no explanation or justification for the carried interest. Carried interest should be eliminated, as should the Department of Education. States do not need the federal government. Can you make that them. louder on carried interest? Can you uh, speak close to the mic on, on the elimination of carried interest? No personal opinion. Uh, give me the mic that works. Uh, no. uh, um, there's, there's no justification, no for, justification carried for carried interest. No justification interest should be eliminated. And the fact that they can't get it done shows about the paralysis of government. Taxes are, t tax is another thing. Uh, you know, and, I've, and I'm going to... Uh, the vast bulk of revenues collected by the U.S. government come from wealthy people, as it should be. I believe in the progressive income tax structure. As a nation, we have to coalesce and decide what should the maximum tax rate be on wealthy people, because that will define the revenue yield to the government, and then the government has to size themselves to that revenue yield. Now, you ask a politician that question, they give you the bullshit lower, you know, because they don't give you an answer. I called Buffett, and I asked Buffett. You know, he was about four years ago. He was getting a lot of talk about, you know, wealthy people pay more in taxes, which I, uh, I happen to agree with. 
And his response was, if you make a million dollars a year, 35%. If you make over $5 million a year, 40%. I signed on the dotted line instantly for that deal. But the fact of the matter is we're already past that for wealthy people. This notion that wealthy people don't pay taxes is completely erroneous. You know, if you live in New York, I happen to be a Florida resident. <laughs> I, I, I love yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, by the way, uh, uh, that let me just let me just tell you, I am not a uh, representative of Florida Chamber of Commerce. I just tell you, you have no idea what you're missing. Uh, by the way, years, uh, I, 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 he's not. Years, it, my alarm clock in Short Hills, New Jersey, goes off at 5:15 in the morning. I spend now and ten minutes going to Manhattan, and now and ten minutes going home at night. Rub it in, rub it in. Yeah, go ahead. It's his financial. It's his health that he's worried listen, about. Listen, uh, I want to give you. Uh, go in, in the back. The All, right. All the way in the back. Just stand up. By the way, that was one question so far. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> That's why you got the mic <laughs> taken away. <laughs> All right, come on. Let's do rapid fire here like uh, TV. Thank you. Um, I want to ask, what role do you see big data and uh, data science play in uh, the investment process going forward? So can I, can I elaborate on just, uh, just uh, so the liberal of this issue of automatization and how is it going to change? So a question for us, for Mario, for Art as well, you know, which is this large theme of how much this is going to be changing our lives, the use of big data analytics and so on and so forth. I mean, you think of it also from the investment perspective, how you, what are the businesses that are going to benefit the most from this process and, uh, you know, how to position your portfolio accordingly? It's pervasive. So one of the things I do, which I'm most proud of, is, is I chair a startup company that's trying to do fusion energy. Um, and um, it's tough. Uh, but I think we're going to conquer it, and then I can get rid of the rest of the people on this panel, and I'll be <laughs> up here alone. But one of the interesting things is that um, when we do a, a test, uh, we have to set a whole bunch of parameters, and we take a shot. And we've taken over 50,000 shots. And we, we ha we're on our sixth machine. In the last machine, we, in collaboration with a very well-known company, we, we started to harvest all the data on the shots and make predictions as to what the knob should be for the next shot to be very efficient. So we wanted to take 10 more shots. And it works. And we brought the new machine up in about six months, and it was taking us two years on other machines. So that's just on a machine, and it, it just, it goes, it's in everything I do. It's, it's pervasive. And, um, and on, on, on the, I, I am one of those people who believe that the real problem is not a lot of the stuff we've talked about, is the problem of employment going forward. I, I strongly believe that um, the, the loss of jobs is going to be the biggest thing that's going to be an impediment to this country, not what that idiot Putin does, not how we manage our relationships with China, not the idiot in North Korea. It's really going to be job creation in the United States, discontent in the United States, and how do we solve that problem? You are not going to stop the technology side of it. Right. It is not it's going to happen. Yeah. yeah, but if I was here in 1890, I would have said that there's a thing in, on the farm area, which is 90% of the employment in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, that is going to create major dislocations in jobs because farmers are going to be put out of work because of the plow and uh, uh, electronic modification. I think a solution author is right here in this room. We have to educate and educate. I don't agree. You think it's too late? No, I think when the automobile was, um, you know, w w was, was brought in, you know, obviously you needed people to buy the automobile. So the guys on the factory line could buy the automobile and it became self-sufficient. These new things of artificial intelligence are not going to lead to new products. They'll lead to a higher quality of life, but that quality of life might be without a job. Okay, but I think, the, uh, but wait, wait. I think Mario, Mario's well, point is, is that important, this is an important point with regards to the right. next 20 years. And right. uh, the, yeah, I'm I mean, glad I think Mario, up. right. I think Mario's point is that we've seen a massive transition before as well, which yeah. was from agricultural to manufacturing, and that was very painful. And you know, when it interacted with uh, the Great Depression, it was incredibly painful for uh, you know the American uh, worker. You know, and the question is whether we are in the cusp of a similar massive transition and it can, whether it can be equally painful. My estimation is that it won't be because we have a lot of uh, institutions that are supposed to protect. Uh, the, I mean, manufacturing is kind of dead in, essentially in the United States and we've managed this transition 
with some success, don't you guys? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's because all those guys in China are driving cars. Now. Absolutely, absolutely. And we make yeah, some I, of the I, parts. I, well, I, the only thing I'd add is I, I think we need to continually rethink the system of government, the system of values that we have in this country. I think the uh, capitalism and democracy as they currently exist, or as they used to exist, served us very well for a long time, but we're beginning to move away from that. And if, if art is right, that we're going to have a permanent class of people for whom there is no way that they can work to support themselves, we got to figure out how to solve that problem. Otherwise, you're going to have revolution in, in, in the streets. We've already yeah. talked about it. You're talking about it. Isn't there minimum income? Hey, Dalla, yeah. Use your machine. Yeah. Yeah, put yeah, your machine to work. So, so we, have, we have time for one more question. Right, so. No, we got time for more. <laughs> Glenn is next. Okay, I'll ask a quick question. Someone has the mic there. We'll get a couple of, uh, be very brief and we'll I'll squeeze a couple brief. of questions. Okay, so I, I work for CalPERS and you know, we are long-term investors, so I think about a lot of long-term issues. Today's Earth Day. I'm curious what you guys think about climate risk and climate um, opportunity related to climate change. Do you guys think about climate risk? Next question. <laughs> fusion. Per personal what Art yeah. has said about fusion is the holy grail. You, and you are sitting there, and you are sitting there not giving him money. It, you're in California, the this company is in California, and I've got to tell you, it is pathetic getting money from the U.S. government, the states, venture capital firms who have a seven-year outlook. It has been, our money is from Russia, Kuwait. I mean, you would not believe how pitiful the environment is to um, invest in innovation in the United States. Yeah, we've got to find Beyond out. apps and that crap. Yeah. <laughs> We are, we are basically in, uh, investors, but uh, please. I have got a story. Lee, Lee wants friendly. to add something. Lee, be brief. Well, I, I, it does not weigh into my investment decisions at all. I do believe in uh, global warming. I have a son who's got a Ph.D. degree and works for Conservation International, but does not enter into my investment decision making. Okay. Yeah, so, hi, uh, Daniel Carter. I'm uh, based in Houston. I uh, invest fund for Saudi Aramco. Um, and you just mentioned Kuwait and, and other companies. My question, or other countries, I was, my question is about sovereign wealth funds. You know, what's the impact that you're seeing with the, you know, the proliferation and, you know, growth in capital, sovereign wealth? Yeah. I, I, I could take a quick shot at it since we, we have several of the sovereign wealth funds as investors in our, our firm. Uh, they invest in our partnerships. There is an enormous accumulation of wealth in other parts of the world, particularly the Middle East, that doesn't have an immediate place to go. And so it's wandering into the global capital markets. Uh, it's begun to get very aggressive and it's begun to get very sophisticated. Uh, you know, we've certainly seen it in the private equity industry and the sovereign wealth funds are major investors in uh, most of the private equity firms uh, in the world right now. I think the next step is going to be to see whether they actually begin to try and acquire businesses themselves or, or use their capital more directly as opposed to paying intermediaries like us to, to invest, them for, uh, invest it for them. But it's, it's another one of those phenomena. I, I put it there with the, the, the fact that private equity has gone from 250 million to three to four trillion. Sovereign wealth funds have done the same thing. They've gone from zero to, I think it's four trillion dollars today of accumulated capital. This has happened in about a 20 year period. So it's a very rapid development. Mark, you want to add anything to that? Or very briefly? Just, just, just briefly, um, I used to manage money for uh, Abu Dhabi and, and some of those guys too. And in, in the past, they were interested, it was a pension fund. They, they just wanted to pay the social liabilities in the country. And that's all they were interested in. That is changing very rapidly right now. Um, and, and all of these guys are looking at the kind of stuff I now do. So, I would just take a point on this score. This score the other way. At the, price, that, you know, at the present price of oil and gas, OPEC runs a $500 billion a year deficit due to their social costs. Uh, uh, you, you look two, at oil two, two struggling quick, to hold $50 a barrel, it's a big problem for them. Two quick answers. Uh, I'd like to get everyone's out. opinion without any, you know, buts, ifs, and howevers. Where do you see the S&P five years from today? And the other question goes to Mario and Lena. Where did you get, what uh, tie sell do you guys get those at? <laughs> well, what was the second part? The second what, is, you're what, coordinating. What, what tie sell do you got them at? Repeat the question. The, the ties are matched, Lee. Whether you guys call, well, the question, Lee, is whether you guys are calling each other every morning to coordinate the ties. No, no, we're the only two that are working on this panel. Ties look matched. Our ties look matched. They're not matched. Uh, 
uh, this is to show you my sensitivity. My wife is in the front row. Yeah, yeah, come on, use the microphone. You've got to give credit she, to your wife for dressing you. She wouldn't say I'm a sensitive human being, but if you look at my tile closely, you can see it's the Columbia insignia. I would say... Just, uh, No, I'm going to answer this question. What's the S&P five years from the... I say the S&P would be anywhere from a return of at best 5% per annum to no return, the S&P. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to change that because rising interest rates are going to provide a major headwind to the multiples. Earnings will do okay. Inflation is going to pick up, and we like pricing power. Next question. Okay. Uh, I'll take one more. I'm sorry. I'm um, just interested in the impact of increasing lifespans and the need for decades-long retirement income and, and wealth. Is that going to impact your, your uh, strategies for the next coming decades? Medical advances, life expectancy, a massive change. We're going to get people living for another 10 years. They will need to consume, to consume leisure, to do a lot of yeah, things. I, for let, 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 me, let me just give you two numbers that I think will, will scare the hell out of you. In 1965, when Linda Johnson passed the Medicare Act, the U.S. economy spent 6% of GNP on health care. Today, we spend 19% of GNP on health care with a population that is living healthier and living longer. One of the things to think about is where's the cap? Is it 20%? Is it 25%? We're not going to spend 100% of our GNP uh, taking care of old people like us. Yeah, but, but this is honest, but I, I can't leave that without saying that we are also screwing the next generation of doctors. We have really, really maligned the profession of medicine in this country, the way we're treating doctors. Okay. So uh, we need to close it. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I hope to see you again next year here. Thank you again.